He joined TPR Index in 1993 and became a partner in 2000. Between 2011 and 2016, Li Tiong joined an unknown owner of a group as a group managing director. He was an executive director of the field in Singapore to spread an industry of engagement from 2010 to 2021. Singapore University of Technology and Design appointed Li Tiong as the head of PIA and central director of design. He became also program director in 2020. Li Tiong is passionate about voluntary work on NGO. He was elected president for Singapore Architects and Institute of Architects, Singapore Green Building Council, also Design Business Chamber of Singapore. And chairman for World Green Building Council. He initiated the advancing net zero movement, resulting in adoption of net zero building worldwide. Please welcome Professor Tai Tsiong. Well, very good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to see you dressed informally <laughs> so that we can uh, have the air conditioned temperature raised slightly. Yeah. <laughs> I brought a jacket along, I shouldn't have. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, I, I will spend the next uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, to speak um, on this topic called Imagine a Net Zero World. Uh, since your week is called Imagination Week, correct? So I need you to imagine with me. Um, I'm not the only one giving you ideas. You should be generating ideas of your own. And we'll talk more about that. Um, thanks, uh, Prof. Xavier, for sharing with me your view about uh, the kind of framing of this uh, discussion about shaping political ecosystem 2050. Uh, the word politics means many things to many people. Of course, in some places, uh, it uh, make all our antennas stand up. <laughs> in some places, it's life per normal. So I, I like it that uh, when you explain uh, in Greek terms what politicals mean, it's the practice and theory of influencing other people on a civic or individual level. It sets me thinking about it that uh, all my life I've been trying to influence someone, right? Uh, when you are a child, you try to influence your parents to give you the presence that you really desire. Um, when in university, we try to influence our professors to give us the best grade. In work, you try to influence your employer to give you the best raise and bonus. We do that all the time, so politics is not new to every one of us. Uh, just about in the peak of well, that I have a several peaks in my career, but one of the peaks in 2007, uh, I was doing very well as a practicing architect uh, with the Singapore firm DP Architects. And my boss at that time told me, said, uh, Lee Xiang, I think you have been very successful uh, in influencing the workplaces, your clients and everyone. I think it's about time you go out and influence the rest of the world. So I said, what do you mean by that? He said, I want you to become the president of the Singapore Institute of Architects. So I said, you know, I am very busy. I'm doing very well. I should be spending time with my family when I do have any time left because of you. <laughs> and uh, why should I go and serve uh, the rest of the community? So he said to me, very simple, if you don't, uh, this profession is going to face far too many challenges that it's going to sink us. So we need help. So I went out and never turned back. Uh, 
work in the NGO circle, work in the institution level has increased many fold over the years. So influencing others to do good work is part and parcel of uh, what I do now. And I'm so pleased that I can be here to influence you and I hope you influence me as well at the end of this session. Now, when we talk about net zero and sustainability, in the last few years especially, I think there were many voices and of course we all kind of think that we are going in the right track. There are certainly haters, there are certainly detractors of sustainability. Um, but to me, I, when especially in my work with the World Green Building Council where I visited about 40 of our country members, I think the greatest uh, enemy is apathy. The greatest enemy is not Donald Trump for sure. <laughs> it's not uh, the person who tell you that I just don't uh, believe in sustainability, at least they believe in something. Uh, the worst is apathy. It's the one who don't care at all. And if you trace um, the kind of reason why they don't care, a lot of times it's down to a lack of knowledge, a complete lack of knowledge in some instances. And it is not a, not a surprising thing that uh, without knowledge, there'll be no actions. So here I am sharing with you some of my knowledge gain over the last um, 10, 20 years on this uh, particular uh, important area. Uh, and I think we need to continue to spread the knowledge wide and far. So I kind of shaped the contents of my presentation in this few area. Where are we? I don't have all the answers. I'd like to hear from you. Where do you think we are in the kind of race to net zero? But some of the things we have to do, uh, regardless of where we are. So I will cover some of those net zero processes, net zero environment, net zero behavior. And finally, how do we start? So where do you think we are right now in terms of sustainability from 1 to 10. 10 means we are doing very well, we're going to overcome it, we're going to bring temperature down, global rising temperature down to zero, we're going to be successful in getting all the countries to do what they want to do, and of course zero is the opposite. How many in this room think that we are at a level 5? One person. Okay, how many of you think that we are at level seven? Nobody. How many of you think that we are at level two? More hands. How many of you think that we are at level one? Okay, the rest, I don't know. If I should ask you, if you're thinking that we are at level zero. Anyway, keep the answers to yourself and uh, make a judgment call as you live day by day, as you walk the streets, as you look at the people out there, ask yourself this question, where are we now in terms of the sustainability drive, All right? But I will talk briefly about a few things that you are familiar with, but I want to just pull out a few salient points that I think are important for our learning. So these are the areas I'll touch on. Rising temperature. Does everyone agree that we, this is real? Yes? It's not fake, right? It's not fictitious, right? It's not rumor, right? It's science. It's proven. So nobody needs to be convinced that there is a rising temperature. And again, with rising temperature, you obviously experience climate change to some degree. Now, I, I live in Singapore most of my time. I spend a period of time in London. Um, but in both places, you don't really experience extreme weather. Surprisingly, in the last, just within the last four, five years, I personally experienced weather that I never experienced before, even for the locals. In about 2017, I Took a, I gave a talk in Istanbul. When we left Singapore airport, it was reported the temperature should be around 2 to 3 degrees. But generally, okay weather. 
when we landed, it was minus two. None of us were prepared and the plane was supposed to dock at the terminal, did not dock at the terminal. We all had to pull out all our cold wear to walk on the tarmac. And by the time I got to Istanbul city centre, the snow was three feet high. So much for weather prediction. <laughs> that was once in, I think, about 20 or 30 years, heaviest snowfall in Istanbul. I don't know how many of you have been to Istanbul. How often do you get snowfall in Istanbul? That is of the height of two to three feet. And about 2018, I took a trip to Tel Aviv to give another talk. And when I arrived that day, it was clear sky. The next day, when I woke up from hotel room, I pulled open my curtains. I was like watching a 1920 movie. It was completely yellow, sepia color. Impossible. They said this has never happened before. One of the worst sandstorm hit Tel Aviv. And just two weeks ago, I was in Japan, taking a, took a Shinkansen from Osaka to Fukuoka on Christmas Eve. Right? You might, some of you might have heard about it. In Osaka, it was clear sky, bright sunshine, because it was on the east side of the mountain. And when it passed through Hiroshima, it was crazy snow. Again, once in a 10-year worst uh, snowstorm. So it is real. I mean, it's phenomenal. It's just we need to open our eyes and see these things. Pandemic, nothing new by now. All of us are familiar with it. The numbers are there to see. But I ask myself this question, what is so different between this pandemic and the previous pandemic like SARS, the Spanish flu, etc.? I think there are two lessons that we need to watch out for in relation to sustainability. First thing is that this is a pandemic that hit the whole world. No country is spared. I know some countries say they have zero cases, but seriously. No country is spared. For the first time, the entire world is hit by the same, more or less the same disease. And the whole economy system broke down. And it really begs the question that sustainability can be the same way too. We can either hit it right or hit it wrong, that the whole world could finally face the same common challenge for the first time, unlike any previous time. And the second lesson is that if we ever put our heads, our hearts together, like the way we fight COVID, we could overcome. There will always be some countries that are very reluctant or wants to do things their own way. But I think we can have a better breakthrough. So I think we should believe that this serves as a great lesson that sustainability or net zero is not insurmountable. It's something we can overcome if we're willing to work together. Uh, this seems to have nothing to do with sustainability, but again, if you are reading about the triple bottom line of sustainability, social sustainability is definitely on the cards. And this is real, right? Uh, we live here in Singapore and many of you come from a very blessed country. You probably don't see this on a daily basis. I, I thought I have seen the fair share of slum. I thought I have seen fair share of poverty. Uh, but just about uh, three weeks ago, I was in Cambodia, uh, meant to join a feeding program. And for the first time, I saw graveyard housing. How many of you have heard of graveyard housing? One person, right? You went, to that place. you went to that place. Fantastic. Do you feel something in your heart about that? It, it, it is quite terrifying, right? And I, I ask myself, uh, why did such things happen? I mean, why can't at least build a slum in a proper place? But here is a place where the living and the dead live together. The kids were playing on the tombstone. The whole ground is under flood level. 
So whenever there's a flood, as you know, Cambodia, Phnom Penh is very prone to the water just wash, cover the whole graveyard. And for these people to get to their platform, they need to roll in a container to get to their platform at least above the water level. That's not the worst part. The worst part is when the water subsides. The amount of rubbish that is left on the housing area is terrible. But I see a bright light out of that because I went into one of the homes and in the, on the platform there are all kinds of rubbish processed. Amazing, right? These people have only one way to earn an income and that's process all the rubbish. A recycling in the grave graveyard housing. Right, so that's where we are. Now, I want to just uh, again highlight this uh, net zero equation that I'm quite sure all of you have heard about. What we mean by net zero is trying to reduce emissions, eliminate emissions, and then balancing greenhouse gas produce and remove from atmosphere. It all sounds very simple, but it's, there's something that's fundamentally not addressed and potentially flawed. And that is we are still producing greenhouse gas and just merely trying to balance it. And I can tell you that many businesses are working the other way around. By determining how much greenhouse gas they want to produce, then they work on those two areas. Now, don't you think there's something wrong with that attitude or that mindset? We should actually fundamentally address if we should even produce any greenhouse gas at all. I know it sounds easy, but it's a change of mindset, a change of attitude that's important. So there are many things that the businesses are doing along this formula that needs to be questioned as to are they really reducing? Are they really willing to reduce? Or are they still more concerned about bottom line, business bottom line, business as usual? But I want to again emphasize the importance of knowledge and ground up actions. There's a lot of talk up there about national contribution and determination but we need to work on the ground up action. Every human being counts and every action counts. So let me move on. <clears throat> so there are three critical areas I would suggest to you to pay attention to in this whole uh, net zero discussion I'm going to present. Of course, we talk about climate change. To me, that's a symptom. It's done due. It will happen. It will continue to happen. But there are issues that are very fundamental that needs to be addressed on three, three aspects, social, economic, environment. On the environment side, over-urbanization. The world's uh, biggest cities are still growing. And we see the likes of Beijing, Shanghai, growing past 20 million in a phenomenal way. And there are many poor cities in Africa still growing past 10 million. Asian cities in particular, and South American cities. That is a big discussion. Secondly, if cities continue to grow, as we all know, I know, because I, I work in the city space a lot, I know cities are dysfunctional. No matter how good they claim the infrastructure is, no cities can be self-sustainable. So if that continues to grow, overconsumption will happen. Just no way to overcome it. And the worst part is this organization. With governments changing year after year sometimes and months, who is organizing us? Are we organizing ourselves? Are we capable of organizing ourselves? If we are not, this is what will happen. So it will just become a vicious cycle. I will touch on three areas about some of the things I think we must do. Uh, first, let's talk about the net zero process. If you're ever going to start a business, think about it. What is your business process going to look like? Is this business as usual, linear? In a linear case of a business, if you start writing a proposal or a paper, you're thinking of a startup that's linear, you basically don't care about what is the end. 
because your job is to vision it, is to produce it, and thereafter the whole problem is handed over to the consumer or the owner who really don't care what you produce, they buy it for their own purposes and thereafter the end has nothing to do with the start. So I told all business people, in my field especially, it has to be the circular business model that you start with an end in mind and you don't wash your hand at the end of selling the product to the consumer because you need to continue to take some kind of ownership over what you produce. Okay? It's difficult, I know, because most right-minded business people will want to quickly get rid of whatever they sell and wash their hands and thereafter have nothing to do with what they produce. But that is exactly the problem. So we need to make business owners own whatever they sell. The net zero process, if you're already in one business process, we need to look at it from the social, economic and environmental aspect. We need to look at the current carbon emissions, carry out an audit. I have customers who, <coughs> who come to me and said, hey, uh, Lisa, I want to go on a net zero process. Uh, I talk to my staff, I talk to my organization, I want to do all this thing under number three, operation. I want to start reducing the carbon, I want to be energy efficient, blah, blah, blah. I said, good, can you tell me what is your bottom line, what's your baseline? Uh, I don't know. That's not a good way to start. I think you really need to know where your baseline emission is today. Then you can work on it. Again, knowledge, transparency. Then with that, you examine your process, you enhance your processes. Now, very important is behavioral change. We talk a lot about hardware all the time, but we fail to understand or see that by changing people's behavior, you can dramatically increase your fight against climate change. And that is very important that uh, most science, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, education doesn't quite teach. And of course, finally, you need to look at the recycling aspect. So in my field, I'm an architect. I will share this with you first about net zero environment. It's not rocket science. It's very easy, right? You're dealing with buildings that cannot move, not like vehicles, buildings that has to perform. So there are a few areas that we just need to pay attention to. One is uh, alternative energy. Of course, in our country, in this city where we don't have any other practical resources, uh, solar is still one of the best, but many buildings are still paying lip service to solarization, putting on the minimum and try to get by. That's not the way. We really need an intelligent and an all-out solution to look at how to get the most out of solar. Materials of the building need to be zero carbon, we need to think about how buildings are planned, not in a traditional way. In the past, we waste a lot of energy. If you look at Shenton Way CBD, look at the different periods of building. There is a period where buildings are all clad in glass. And that's a killer as far as energy is concerned. And then people come up with better glass, but still, we need to rethink those paradigms. Easy, relatively easy part. And the whole formula of green building is very simple. A, generate as much energy from solar. B, change user behavior, reduce the need for energy consumption, reduce the reliance on carbon intensity for comfort. And when you finish all this, you find that there isn't enough and we need to depend on alternative source of uh, renewable energy it's a valid consideration, but if you find that a building requires more than three quarters of its energy from elsewhere, then you need to rethink the paradigm of development. And I suggested to my colleagues in the built environment that we should rethink about how much we really need to build. Is it a maximization model 
or is it a responsible model? Now, many countries like Singapore has its planning parameter based on a certain maximum quantum or maximum intensity that you can build on. And every developer will tell you, because of that planning consideration, I will go for the maximum. Because if I don't maximize it, I'm not getting the yield I want from the land. And with that in mind, you see buildings all over the world, including Singapore, grow phenomenally big and huge, regardless of whether the market needs it, whether the owners and the occupiers need them. So you find that a lot of buildings suddenly become ghost towns all over the world, including ours. Even when pandemic hit, we start to question how much of the building office space that we really need. Just look at COVID-19. Most of you can work from home. You no longer need the office. I'm glad that happened. So it forces us to rethink built environment paradigm. So cities are typically bad because Many of them evolve from small towns and villages into big cities without complete consideration for a sustainable infrastructure. And hundreds of years later, you have a city, a monster city, that the infrastructure cannot cope. Right? This city is well known for that problem. Singapore, I think we still manage to keep the infrastructure in tandem with physical development. But I'd like to suggest you to think again, what kind of cities do you really like to live in? I happened to spend four or five days here because I was interacting with university on that side of town. So they housed me on Roosevelt Island. And those of you who have been there or come from there will know that this is a far better environment to live for and play than up there. And if you go to New York City today, you see all this pencil tall, buildings that are like 60, 70 stories that has only one apartment per floor. Have you seen those? All right? And it's interesting to see them at night because the only apartments that are lit is the one on top and the rest is all dark. Tells you something, right? It's a simple, stupid real estate play that works for the developer because by just selling that top unit enough to pay for the whole development. But it's absolutely irresponsible, as far as I can tell. So we need to think about what a sustainable city should look like. It should be sustainable, it should be responsible, enough for our use, not for speculation. All right, net zero businesses. There are many business models that are sustainable, but it's none quite like this company that I interacted with quite a fair bit. It's called Interface. It's a carpet manufacturing company uh, based in the US. And I happened to learn this story when I was a uh, chairman for World Green Building Council. This man here, Ray Anderson, was a founder and CEO. And very early on in 1990s, when his company was doing very well because of the real estate boom, and someone actually challenged him and asked him what was he doing about the environment. And he had a eureka moment and said, no, I think there's something not quite right with my business model. And he decided as early as 1994 that they had to cut the umbilical cord of oil. And it's a very brave move because if you think about it in 1994, some of you may be too young to remember, uh, it was really the start of real estate boom. What you see today of exorbitantly expensive property and real estate really started in the 1980s and 1990s. So to pivot from a conventional business to one that's green business as early as that is a very brave move. Now today, these are some of his uh, company's achievements, uh, be it uh, high dependent on renewable energy to run the factory, and the other aspect is the use of recyclable material for the carpet making uh, business to prevent it from being a highly consuming and pollutive industry. Um, so this is to me a very, very courageous company 
that decide to do something different, uh, even if it means uh, their profit margin is compromised. And I can tell you that this is one of the most sought after company as far as carpet business is concerned today. And in running an organization, uh, again, as part and parcel of the World Green Building Council advisory, because we have members who are developers, who are manufacturers, consultants, and we start to put together this very simple chart to look at uh, what really drives sustainability in companies. It's not a rocket science, right? So we have companies, many of them, sorry, uh, how do I go back? All right. Many of them that starts at level one, which is basically voluntary. A very small group of people who takes action only when there is time. If not, nothing happens. Then we have committees that get officially appointed to do something. Finally, a department is set up and they have KPIs related to sustainability. But I would suggest that at this time, in this day and age, there's nothing short of a C-suite leadership that's necessary to drive sustainability in business. Because only when senior management sets goals and builds it into their business KPIs, then you will see fundamental change. And I think this to me is a must. And there are no two ways about it. But there is a better way, a higher way than this, and that is to build culture. Organization culture where sustainability is firmly embedded in the DNA of the company. And when you talk about culture, don't if you want to know how sustainable the company is, don't ask the CEO. You should ask the person at the bottom of the hierarchy. Ask them hard questions. Do they actually practice sustainability in the company? And if they say yes and they show it, then I think you have a culture. So finally, I'm going to talk a few things uh, about under this part, what must we do, a net zero culture, since we talk about culture. And you must uh, have been to some of these countries, I think. Uh, just again, just curious for to question, how many of you have been to Costa Rica? Alright, two, three, alright. How many of you have been to Denmark? More, alright. How many of you have been to Japan? Oh, well, when you are in this part of the world, you should make a trip there. I've been to two out of three. I've not been to Denmark, but I've been to all the other Scandinavian countries. I think they are quite similar. And uh, of course, Costa Rica, when I first heard about their, their net zero pursuits, I almost couldn't believe it because when I was there, that was 2018, um, I didn't quite see everything I wanted to see. But through further interaction and investigation, I'm happy to say that it is indeed uh, doing some of these things. And as far as biodiversity is concerned, no questions asked. I think that's really become a national thing as far as Costa Rica is concerned. For Denmark, I think it's easy, it's well reported, and those of you who have been there agree, right, that this is really a very, very green country, and some of the achievements are amazing. And even in my trip to uh, Norway, Finland, uh, Sweden, uh, they are just about similar, and I'm very sure that they achieve what they set out to do here. In Japan, of course, since you're in Asia, I strongly encourage you to make a trip there and study the culture and look at how they uh, achieve their brand of sustainability. Language barrier sometimes is a little bit of a problem for us to understand. But my greatest takeaway for it is that it is a culture that is brought up since young. And I did ask some of the Japanese as to why, why do they think of sustainability the way they think about it, uh, as in a loop or as in a closed circle. So uh, it is partly apparently inspired by their, their belief system and their religion. And they gave me a classic example. They say a child is taught very young that whatever 
things you take from anywhere, you must put it back. So, are there any Japanese here? No, not that I can see. All right, so in case I say the wrong thing, please verify. Uh, but they say because of that upbringing, so they are very aware that whatever you take away from the environment, from the people, you need to put it back. I guess um, in some ways uh, it is quite true. If you go to Japan and look at what they do in the country, you can hardly find trash bin around. Uh, whatever trash that you generate, you just have to take care of it back home. Um, there are other things that associated with Japanese culture. I'm not quite sure how, whether they relate to sustainability, things like sake and lots of drinking after work. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's their way of renewing. How many of you watch World Cup? Anyone from Argentina? Anyone from France? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Looks like I touched on the raw nerve. Alright, never mind. It's okay that France lost. You'll win again next time. Uh, but look at, look at what the Japanese did. Right? It's amazing. How can, how can a group of people, after a game, collect the rubbish and keep the whole place so clean? Is this organized by the Prime Minister of Japan? Is this organized by some Ministry of Environment of, of the Japanese government? No, it's ground up. And it's so creative, making use of a blue trash bag as also something to cheer the team on. So, I believe, I'm a firm believer of ground up actions, as much as top down, but I think ground up has even greater strength. And I'm a firm believer of self-organization. So finally, uh, how do we start? Just a few more slides before we conclude. We need net zero people. In my time with the World Green Building Council that I thoroughly enjoy, both as a council member, board member, and the chairman, uh, we have 70 country members and we eat, sleep, and talk sustainability non-stop. And it is with people like that, that you influence each other, you challenge each other, you encourage each other, because it's so important that we do that. Sustainability is not an easy journey. It's sometimes a very lonely journey. But with like-minded people around, we build phenomenal things. It's not a big NGO, it's only 70 country members, but we raise our voice at COP21 together with a few other global organizations, we prove very simply that if our buildings don't become net zero, we will never be able to bring global warming down to below two degrees Celsius. So we announced in COP21 that all buildings must achieve net zero by 2050. Now at that time, we were still naive to believe that we'll get there. Now we are facing real challenge to know that we are far from hitting that. So, but my point is that to get there, you need a lot of believers. You need a lot of friends. You need a lot of encouragers. And you need a net zero people to do that. The second thing we did is as soon as we announced the importance of net zero, we published case studies, numbers, facts on how to get to net zero in small ways, big ways, medium ways, whatever. Education came in very quickly and it helps a lot of people to understand how to get to net zero or partial net zero in practical ways. The worst thing is not teaching people. So I think it's very important we do that. This report is free, you can download it as well. It's been published since 2017, and we proved in business terms that you can achieve a viable net zero environment and development. And of course, campaigns. 
campaigns are important to reach out to the masses. Uh, so my point about ground up initiative is that we cannot do this alone. We need a lot of voices, a lot of people to help us. Net Zero is amazing. It actually spin off so many innovations in the, just within the last five to 10 years. And you find new innovations that were never before possible until we start to think about sustainability and innovation. So we have urban planning that takes on new ways of planning a city, like the Tianjin Eco Cities. Not perfect, but it's a good start. We have buildings that now don greenery instead of glass facade. We have buildings that can prove that it is totally possible to be energy self-sufficient. High-speed rail, and I look forward to today where we have an electrified all transport system. Something 10 years ago, we hardly hear people talking about it. Wind energy, nobody believed that it can power a nation. That's what Denmark is so good at. Green financing, vertical farming. Singapore is quite big on this in order to achieve our 30% self-sufficient target. So I, I think that net zero and sustainability could potentially be building up a new renaissance. A renaissance that is of the tech type, a renaissance that is of the digital type, but yet at the same time improve and enhance quality of life, especially for the bottom 10%. So with that, I come to the end of my uh, short talk. And I think we should continue to be hopeful. We may not reach the target of lowering the global temperature warming by 2 degrees by 2050, maybe one degree, but whatever number, I will take it. And we must take decisive actions and act while we have time to turn the tide. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.